Good morning. We are this morning going to finish up what has turned out to be a three-part series on the authority of, of God, the authority of Christ, and the work of the church. The two topics that I wanted to cover that we haven't gotten to so far uh, that we'll cover this morning are, one, uh, when uh, sometimes we object to certain activities that somebody suggests the, the church get involved with or that some other church is getting involved with. Uh, we object to that and say, I don't see authority for that in the New Testament. And, and someone says, well, well, God didn't say not to do it, so it must be okay. So we'll talk about that. And then we'll talk about uh, what uh, are sometimes called, and I call, uh, aids, additions, and substitutions for what God has asked for. We'll talk about that toward the end of our lesson this morning. But first, I would like to kind of remind ourselves uh, of what we've been talking about so far. Not, not everything that we've talked about so far, uh, but a couple of things that I think are good to call to mind for our lesson this morning. In Ephesians chapter 2, we read that Jesus is the head of the church, and therein is the, the concept of authority. That our work, since he's the head of the church, that our work must follow his rule, not just follow whatever we think is a good idea. And I'll remind you of these two passages that we've looked at in Matthew chapter 21, when uh, Jesus was doing various things, and the Pharisees came and they asked him, by whose authority do you do these things? And Jesus put a question to them about John's baptism, what they thought of that, and the way Jesus phrased that question of authority was, was John's baptism from heaven or from men? And they knew the implications of that. They knew the implications that uh, if it was from heaven, they should have obeyed it. And if John's baptism was only from men, then it really didn't matter that it wasn't something they should follow. Um, so this question is important to us as we think about various things that churches might get involved in. Is it from heaven? Does God tell us to do that? Or is it from men? It's just something we've come up with on our own. That's a, an important question. And then Colossians chapter 3. I'm having trouble this morning keeping these buttons straight. Which one goes forward and which one goes backward. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, where Paul says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to him to God the Father. We talked at length when we talked about this passage a few weeks ago, what it means to do something in the name of the Lord. It means to do it by his authority. It's just, we use that same phrase uh, when police officers operate and they arrest someone in the name of the law. That police officer himself doesn't have personal authority just out of his own self to incarcerate someone. But as he sees someone violating the law, the law gives him the authority to arrest that person, to throw that person behind bars. That's what it means to do something in the name of someone or something. And so our, our actions, Colossians 3.17, in word or deed, all must be in the name of the Lord Jesus, by the authority of the Lord Jesus, that he's given authority for those things. All right, well, we also talked about, uh, at more length, um, the works that, that at least I see in the New Testament given to churches, things that we can read in the New Testament that, you know, shows an example of a church doing this good thing or a, a command given to a church, do this thing. Uh, or in some cases, it's... Uh, stated in a way that it absolutely implies this is a thing that the church ought to do. Uh, and so we've, uh, I'm just going to go quickly through this list again, just to remind you of, of these things. We read in the New Testament, Acts chapter 14, for example, that a church should select elders to lead the church. 
that a church should have deacons to serve the church, that a church collects and holds a contribution. As a few minutes ago, uh, we collected a contribution here. We read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We read about churches providing support for those who are busy teaching the word. We read about churches providing benevolence or, uh, support for widows who are really widows, uh, as Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 5. We read about gifts of benevolence to Christians in need. The, the care for the widows was an ongoing thing. Uh, these gifts of benevolence to Christians in need was kind of a temporary need kind of issue. Uh, but when Christians in Judea were suffering uh, from famine and poverty, churches in other parts of the Roman Empire sent funds to help those Christians in Jerusalem. Uh, in Acts chapter 15, we see a church disavowing the message that had supposedly come from them. And uh, so we see that kind of thing. Uh, and in several passages, we see the church assembling together. That's, you know, kind of, we don't even think about that question. Well, of course churches should assemble together. But, but no, we learn that from passages that teach a church should assemble together. And then the, the right-hand column on this screen uh, are things that churches do when they assemble together. And we see these things in the New Testament, that a church should partake of the Lord's Supper when they assemble together on the first day of the week. We see in Acts chapter 14, uh, Paul coming back with Barnabas and presenting an evangelistic report of, of the things they had done on that first journey in the assembly of the church. We see congregational prayer and congregational singing in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 in the assembly of the church. In 1 Corinthians 5, delivering an unfaithful brother over to Satan because of his sin in the assembly of the church. Instruction, edification, exhortation, consolation. I've kind of grouped those together. Those are things we see being commanded to be done when brethren assemble together. Hearing a rebuke in 1 Timothy chapter 5. Uh, Paul is talking to Timothy about working with elders and, and, and solving problems with elders. And uh, that elders ought to be, you know, challenged when they're not doing what is right. And he says when they continue in sin to rebuke them in the presence of all. That is in the assembly. Uh, appointing deacons is something we read about in the assembly. Um, and then discussing and making congregational decisions. We see that in a couple of passages. So those things are things that we read about that churches are by the very nature of those passages authorized to do. These are works that a congregation can and should do. How do I know that? Because I have passages where Jesus, who is the head of the church, inspires men to, to write, these are things that a church does and should do. So I know that these things are right. I know that he has authorized these things, and so we have clear authority for churches to do these things. Other things, we could only guess. You know, if there's something that's not shown to us in the New Testament, not something we could put in this list, if it's something people just come up with, then we can only guess, well, maybe the Lord would be happy with this. But if he hasn't authorized it, then we can't do it in the name of the Lord. We're only doing it in our name. <laughs> the Lord will not be happy with that because Jesus is the head of the church. Well, let's use one of these items to go into a little bit more detail. And we'll begin with the question, is it right for a church to organize meals for its members? Well, you know, somebody wants to, the church to organize a meal, a supper. Um, and uh, my response to that, my response to anything that is suggested that the church do is, well, is it in this list of things that the New Testament authorizes churches to do? 
organizing a meal. Now, you may be used to instantly saying no to that. But in fact, in a limited way, it is there. Right over here, providing benevolent support for widows indeed. Let's go to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Now at this time, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. And the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables, but select from among you, brethren, seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task, overseeing the providing food for these widows. The church in Jerusalem, that congregation, had the task to provide widows, uh, to, pro to provide food for those widows who were truly left alone and in need of help. Uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, Paul writes about that same issue. Uh, about how uh, the church should provide for these women. So, uh, yes, providing a meal, organizing a meal, is something that is the work of a local congregation in this limited way. But you know what we never see in the New Testament is just churches planning social meals and pancake breakfasts and, and that kind of thing. Uh, just for uh, whatever other purposes one might come up with. Uh, as, as we see this kind of thing typically practiced, there's no authority in the New Testament for those things. I have no way of saying this is right. When somebody wants to say, let's just get the whole church together for a, a barbecue, and the church will plan it, and the church will pay for it, and maybe the church will build a kitchen so that we can do this kind of thing regularly. Where is that in these things that the Bible says we have authority for? It's not there. You might build a kitchen with authority for the widows. Now, I think in most cases, you know, when you have uh, a number of older women in the congregation who cannot provide for themselves and don't have family provide for themselves. They live in a lot of different places, so maybe building a central kitchen isn't the best way to solve that. Uh, but there might be a situation where there are a number of widows and they all live very close, and, and uh, maybe building a kitchen would be the best way to provide regular meals that the church is commanded to do for those widows. But that's not what church kitchens are usually used for, is it? So, all right. So I, I wanted to use that as an example to think about how do we think about practical things, uh, ideas that people come up with for something that the church, they say, should get involved with. Um, so now I want to move on to, to this objection that God didn't say not to do a certain thing. Uh, you know, God didn't say not to have pancake breakfasts. Well, you know, that's, that's not the way authority usually works. For the church to engage in some activity, since Jesus is the head of the church, since all authority has been given to him, since we need to do everything in his name, since we need to ask, is this activity from heaven or from men, like Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 21, we need to be able to show that he has authorized a thing for a church to do. Not just that, well, he didn't say not to do it. So, there's a story that illustrates 
as well. I mean, I, 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 to me, Colossians 3.17, uh, to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, that is by his authority, if he's authorized it, then churches should do it. That speaks powerfully. When Jesus talks about matters that we should or should not follow, he poses it in the question, is it from heaven or from men? That speaks powerfully. But there's a story in the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 8, if you'll turn there, that I think illustrates this principle very well, that uh, when you do the things God commands, and, and then you throw in something that he didn't command, that he didn't authorize, and you say, well, he didn't say not to do it, I think this story illustrates the problem with that very well. Uh, Leviticus chapter 8, uh, actually chapters 8 through 10, tells us the story uh, when the Israelites are at Mount Sinai on their way from Egypt up to the Promised Land of the consecration ceremony for Aaron and his sons to serve as priests in Israel. And we're going to go through chapters 8 through 10 and look at this. By the way, when I first became aware of seeing Leviticus chapters 8 through 10 in this way, I was seated in one of these pews here in this church building years ago. In 1986 or 1987, Dan Peters held a meeting here, and he presented this, and I thought, that's powerful, and I've remembered it ever since. So, Leviticus chapter 8, verse 1, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments and the anointing oil, and the bowl of the sin offering, the two rams, and the basket of unleavened bread, and assemble all the congregation at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Notice verse 4. So Moses did just as the Lord commanded him. When the congregation was assembled at the doorway of the tent of meeting, Moses said to the congregation, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded to do. Verse 4 tells us, Moses did just as the Lord commanded. The Lord said, do it. So Moses did that. He did just that. And he tells the people, this is the thing the Lord has commanded. The things we're doing, it's what the Lord has commanded us to do. Verse 6, then Moses had Aaron and his sons come near and washed them with water. And he put the tunic on him and girded him with the sash and clothed him with the robe and put the ephod on him, and he girded him with the artistic band of the ephod with which he tied it to him. He then placed the breast piece on him, and the breast piece he put, and in the breast piece he put the urim and the thummim. Is, is Moses just making this stuff up? Are these things that Moses thought, you know, we're, we're consecrating Aaron and his sons to be priests. I think this would be a good idea to do. The Spirit told him, you know, I have this feeling in my heart that I think is maybe the Spirit telling me we should do this. No, no. Verse 9, he also placed the turban on his head, and on the turban at its front, he placed the golden plate, the holy crown, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. That's the third time in a few verses that we've seen this thing about whatever the Lord commanded, that's what Moses is doing. And as you read through this chapter and the next. You see that phrase over and over. Verse 13 of chapter 8. Next, Moses had Aaron's sons come near and clothed them with tunics and girded them with sashes and bound caps on them, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Verse 17. But the bull and his hide and his flesh uh, and his refuse he burned in the fire outside the camp just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Verse 21, And after he had washed the entrails of the legs with water, Moses offered up the whole ram in smoke on the altar. And it was the burnt offering for a soothing aroma. It was an offering by fire to the Lord, 
just as the Lord had commanded Moses. I remember Phil Roberts, one of my teachers in college, telling us, when you read a passage in the Bible and you see a phrase repeated over and over and over again, realize God is emphasizing that thought to you. That's why he repeats it over and over. When you were a kid and your parents told you something over and over, what did that tell you? It told you that was important and they were emphasizing that to you. In these chapters, we see this, this thing repeated over and over. What was the last one of those I read? Verse 21, I think. Dropping down to verse 29. Moses also took the uh, breast and presented it for a wave offering before the Lord. It was Moses' portion of the ram of ordination, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Verse 34, the Lord, and Moses is speaking to the people about the things they're doing. And he says in verse 34, the Lord has commanded to do as has been done this day. Over and over we read, he does this. He did it just as the Lord commanded. And he emphasizes to the people, what we're doing are the things the Lord has commanded for us to do. They were doing the right thing. They were listening to what the Lord said, do this. And they did that, just as the Lord commanded. Into chapter 9, verse 4. And an ox, a ram, for a peace offering, to sacrifice before the Lord, and a grain offering mixed with oil. For today, the Lord shall appear to you. Imagine that. They're going to do these things that the Lord has commanded to be done. And then, Jehovah God, in some form, is going to appear to them. What the anticipation for that hang for a moment while we look at verse 6. And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded you to do, that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. Verse 7 Moses then said to Aaron, Come near the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering, that you may make atonement for yourself and for all the people. Then make the offering for the people that you may make atonement for them just as the Lord has commanded. Moses didn't make anything up. The Lord commanded this to be done. He did it. The Lord commanded that to be done. He did it. And he told the people the things we're doing. It's what the Lord commanded us to do. Get down to the end of chapter 9, verse 23. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. When they came out and blessed the people, the glory of the Lord, the glory of Jehovah, Yahweh, appeared to all the people. Then fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the portions of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted, and fell on their faces. Can you imagine? Honestly, we can't imagine what that would have been like to see the glory of the Lord. Fire coming down and consuming the sacrifice that they've been told to offer. They shall fall on their faces. What a remarkable thing. God had told them what to do. And they had done it. Just as the Lord had commanded. Chapter 10. Verse 1. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. The Lord had told them what to do. He told them to burn these offerings that he had told them to bring. Nadab and Abihu 
had done that. They had participated in all that God had commanded. It's not like they were rejecting and refusing to do some of the things that God had said do. They had obeyed the Lord in all these things. And then they thought, let's do this other thing also. I don't know what was the strange thing about this fire they offered, but it wasn't something God had commanded. He had commanded some fire to be used, and Nadab and Abihu are bringing in some form some different, some strange fire before the Lord. Well, you know, they're just a couple of young men who are excited about serving the Lord and doing things for the Lord. And uh, God had commanded them to do some things, and they had done those things. And now they think, well, this would be a good idea to glorify God, too. We'll, we'll do this also. How does it turn out? Verse 2. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord. Oh, it's going to be like the end of chapter 9 again. It's going to be amazing. No. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. They died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, It is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy, and before all the people, I will be honored. God hadn't said, don't use this other fire. But he had said what he wanted them to do. And they've done that. And then Nadab and Abihu said, let's do this also. And imagine if someone had objected and said, no, but, but, but you know, God asked for these things. He authorized us to do these things. And Nadab and Abihu might have said, well, he didn't say not to do this other thing also. It doesn't matter that he hadn't said not to. In fact, at the end of verse 1, we read that this is something which he had not commanded them. The verse doesn't say this was a thing God had said not to do. The verse says this is a thing that he had not commanded them. And that should have been enough. When churches today are commanded to do this and do this, uh, you know, back to our previous screen, do these things, and we want to add, well, let's build a kitchen just for pancake breakfast. And we say, well, God didn't say not to. We're in the same shoes with Nadab and Abihu. God's response to this is to send fire from heaven and consume Nadab and Abihu in that fire. And then this statement. And remember, this is... This, these two young men are Aaron's sons, Moses' nephews. Then Moses said to Aaron, It is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy, and before all the people, I will be honored. And so Aaron, therefore, kept silent. You would think Aaron might have cried out and objected and said, this is terrible, and how could you do this, and this isn't just. After all, you didn't say not to do these things. But Aaron keeps silent because he realizes that even though these two young men were his sons, that they had not acted by the authority of the Lord. They'd done something beyond what the Lord had asked for. So what does it mean to treat the Lord as holy? What does it mean to honor the Lord? That's what Moses quotes God about there in verse 3. This is what the Lord spoke. By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. Before all the people, I will be honored. What, 
What it means to treat the Lord as holy and to honor him is to respect his authority and do the things he has said to do and not add other things to that based on the fact that, well, he didn't say not to. All right. That's Leviticus 8 through 10. It did not work out well for Nadab and Abihu to do some things just because God had said not to. We need to treat God as holy and honor him. All right. The second part and final part of our lesson this morning has to do with aids, additions, and substitutions. Um, Let's turn back to Genesis chapter 6. So I've mentioned in these previous lessons, uh, in the first two lessons of, of this kind of series of lessons, um, things like this whiteboard. Well, that's not in the New Testament. God didn't say to buy a whiteboard. This projector. God didn't say, you know, buy a projector and, and we bought a projector. Are we doing something beyond what God has commanded? The, the, the song books that we have, that's not in the New Testament. They had books. Um, but we don't read of song books in the New Testament. So are we going beyond what God has said to do? So let's look at the ark in Genesis chapter 6, verses 14 through 16. Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself, an, I, I said verse 14, it started in 13, sorry about that. Now verse 14. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood, and you shall make an ark with rooms, and shall cover it inside and outside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. The breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top and set the door of the ark in the side of it. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. There's the instruction from God to know. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. Well, as Moses prepares to, to fulfill that command, are there some aids and methods he needed to use in order to carry out this command, in order to, to obey this command? Well, I, I would say that it is necessarily implied that he needs to use some aids, some tools, some methods to do that. And we rightfully infer, necessarily infer, that Moses needed to use some tools of some kind, some aids to carry out that command. I don't know if they had saws back then. I suspect more likely they had axes back then. But he's got to make an ark, a great big boat, out of gopher wood. That's going to require some cutting and chopping and something. So either you know, a saw or an axe, or I don't know if they didn't have those, if he trained some beavers to cut the wood in the right places. He needed some tools of some kind, some aids to carry out that command. The instructions didn't include use an axe. But it said build the ark of gopher wood. Moses would have been right to say, okay, I'm going to obey this command to build an ark. I need something to do that with, an aid to help him carry out the command. What if Moses and Noah had decided, you know, in the living quarters on the ark, I really think it would be nice to use this other kind of wood. <clears throat> We don't really know if gopher wood refers to like the species of a tree, and that one was called gopher wood, or if it's some process that wood goes through and therefore it's called gopher wood. Don't know exactly what gopher wood was, but whatever it was, 
if Noah had started thinking, you know, in the living quarters, I really think this other kind of wood would be really a, a lot nicer. And that will glorify God because we built this beautiful thing. That would be a substitution for what God had said to do. What if Noah had decided, you know, we've got the second and third deck, we've got the first deck and the second deck and the third deck and our living quarters take up a big part of this and all of those animals take up a whole lot of that space. It would be so nice. I mean, we're going to be on that ark for a year. It would be so nice to have a fourth deck for recreation, recreation deck. That, my friends, would have been an addition. And maybe Noah would say, well, we did all the things God commanded. We built the ark out of gopher wood. We built it by the dimensions. We built the first and second and third deck. We just thought it would be a good idea to add a fourth deck. That would have been an addition to what God had commanded. Some things are aids. Some things that churches get involved with, that churches make decisions about, are aids to carry out a command. Like Moses using an axe to cut the wood to build the ark. Other things are substitutions for what God had said. God said, I want this, and instead of doing that, we do that. That's not operating by the authority of the Lord. So we think about the question, is it from heaven or from men? Well, the thing God asked for is, is the thing that's from heaven, and our substitution is from men. And that's a huge mistake. And some things are additions, where we say, well, we're not neglecting the things God said do. We've done them all. It's just we thought it'd be good to add this other thing, too. Like they'd have to buy you. They've done all that God had commanded, and they thought, well, let's just add this other thing, too. And they were consumed in fire because of that mistake. Moses makes clear that they were not honoring the Lord. They were not treating him as holy because they had gone beyond and added something God did not say to do. So we'll go back as we close our lesson this morning about a kitchen, a church deciding to build a kitchen. Well, if that's limited to that responsibility of a church to care for its widows and provide food for them, then that's a tool, an aid, a method to carry out something that God commanded be done. If that kitchen is just because we want to get together as a congregation as a whole to enjoy having meals together, that is not something God has commanded. That's not doing just as the Lord had commanded. That's being made out of by you and saying, we're going to add this thing because we think it's a good idea. Songbooks. They're not in the Bible. But we do have those. Where is that in the list of things, that big long list of things that the Bible authorized? Well, one of those things was the command to sing, congregationally, to sing. Now, we need some way to sing, some tool to sing. One of the ways that some early Christians, we don't see this you know, specifically mentioned in the Bible, but we know from history, is that they would uh, have echo and response singing. The, someone would start a song, they would sing a line, and then the congregation would sing that line. That was a way for everybody to know what we're singing. The leader would sing a line, and then the congregation would sing that line. And the leader would sing the next line, and the congregation would sing that line. They have to have some way of knowing what we're singing. God hasn't said anything about how we go about that, about what tool we use, in order to sing and all be singing the same thing. But a songbook is an aid to sing. I, I find that at least uh, an appropriate tool, an appropriate aid 
fulfill the command to sing. What about a church band? Is a band a way to sing? Is a band a method for singing? No, that, that's adding something different. That's adding something beyond what God has asked for. Aids, substitutions, uh, additions, and substitutions. We must not add to what God has said he wants churches to do. We must not substitute one thing for something that God has authorized churches to do. We need to simply fulfill the things God has said to do. And some of those things require having some way, some method, some tool, you know, collecting and holding a contribution. The Bible never mentions bank accounts, but that's a way, a tool, to hold that money that the church has collected. Just as Paul said, you know, collect it now so that there won't have to be collections when I get there. I need to hold it somewhere. We might use a bank account as a tool to do that. Well, I hope these lessons that I've, I've been presenting are helpful to you and hope they're clarifying to you. <coughs> Authority <coughs> is an important topic. Colossians 3, verse 17 tells us to do all things in the name of the Lord, to know we have authority for the things that we do. Just as Moses was able to say, the things that we're doing, we're doing them just as the Lord had commanded us to do. We need to know that our plans are from heaven and not from men in order to know that we're doing, uh, in order to know that we're honoring the Lord and treating him as holy. Well, if you are thinking about your own life this morning, uh, if you have some need, uh, if you want to ask for the prayers of, of the church here, if you need to come forward to be baptized or repent of some sin, we'd ask you to come as we stand and sing. Jesus and be always pure and good. Would you walk with him?